the surface? Did, did your family seem like a regular, typical Aussie? family if someone was observing your family from the outside. Telling video of a suspect has surfaced less than a week after his death. I guess they might consider that except well well it, it got weird pretty early on. Now members of Max McIntyre's own family are convinced their father was involved in Jane, Anna and Grant's disappearance and that they know where the children are buried. Could this man hold the key to Australia's greatest criminal mystery? How did you come to Put them down. And they were deceased in the boot of a car. Now, my father made my two sisters look at the children in the boot of the car, said that it smelt like burning hair. So I believe my father had a whole heap of other treasures. And, and we're talking about a serial killer here, so this is really revolting stuff, but this is what people were smelling. She died in very strange circumstances. There's never been an inquest into her death, my father's first wife. Her three elder, my three older siblings always believed that something terrible had happened to her. A lot of people would have heard of the missing case of Louise Bell. Um, her first real name was actually Tracy. Um, she went missing in 1983 in January. Richard Kelvin went missing six months later. Both children my father had an involvement with. So he was he was a Rosicrucian, also a Freemason, um, and a member of the Golden Dawn sect and, and a Satanist, basically. we are very honoured to welcome a very special guest. Our guest is a survivor of uh, child abuse with some harrowing and terrific tales of abuse. She also knows what happened to the missing Beaumont children. But more importantly, our guest is a prominent and well-respected human rights activist who tirelessly advocates for the rights of children. Rachel Vaughan, Vaughan, welcome to the podcast. Lovely to see you, Leon. Thank you for having me. It's such an honour to have you uh, here. Thank you. I first came across uh, your advocacy and your work uh, in 2020 during the lockdowns when I heard your testimony uh, before a committee that uh, Sasha Stone chaired. Um, but Rachel, I'd like to start by asking uh, about Adelaide. So uh, that's the city where you grew up in. And to be honest, I've never been to Adelaide, but I've heard a lot about it. And on the surface, it looks like a very suburban, very normal and fr friendly, uh, family friendly city. Uh, but then I'm hearing all these stories, all these horrific stories that seem to be in stark contrast to that image. Yeah. So I'm, and that kind of leaves me scratching my head and thinking, well, what's, what's going on with uh, the city of Adelaide? Um, can you? give our guests tonight some insights on that. Absolutely. So Adelaide is very much presented the way that you've just described. And, you know, there's there's a lot of talent in Adelaide, but it usually leaves Adelaide because not a lot happens in my city. The problem with Adelaide is that it's run by Freemasons and a lot of Australia is, um, but, um, yeah, Adelaide is in particular. And, you know, just one example is this enormous monolith that they're trying to, built in the um, Adelaide CBD at the moment, the biggest skyscraper we're likely to have is a big Freemason, Freemason building that they're trying to put up. And that's just so they can lord it over everybody else, basically. That's, that's the way it works. So, you know, if you want to get anywhere in Adelaide, you usually have to be high up in those ranks. Um, Adelaide's, surprisingly, the murder capital of the world, is it has that moniker. And when you look at all the other, I mean, it, it literally is not the murder capital of the world, but it's known as that because of the family murders and, and a whole series of other things that have happened here. So the family murders were a group of boys and young men who were uh, abducted and tortured and murdered. And many of the bodies were left out to be found in the 1970s and 1980s. Really horrific stuff. Uh, and that was a, a, a terrifying terrifying campaign like it that was an attempt to terrify the the populace I believe because there was no real reason to leave the bodies out um I don't want to go too too much into the the, the gory details but um there's also a case previous to that in the 1960s where three children went missing from Glenelg Beach nine-year-old Jane Beaumont her seven-year-old sister Anna and Grant their four-year-old brother 
are about to catch the bus to the beach. Little kids back then were innocent. We were allowed to have fun. We could sleep with our doors open. We could watch telly out the back. We could do whatever we wanted to. It was safe. Their dad, Jim, is away, up north in Snowtown on business. Jim's wife, Nancy, gives their eldest daughter, Jane, enough small change to cover bus fares and lunch. She watched them walk to the bus stop uh, just down the street. And when you look at all of the, everybody that's sort of aware of your podcasts, I'm sure they're aware of things like predictive programming and, um, you know, mind control and those sorts of things. So what, what we're dealing with in Adelaide is a lot of those experiments going on on the wider population through these sorts of horrific sort of experiences. So again, you know, the, the Beaumont children case, three children who went missing from Glenelg Beach all on the same day in 1966, all from the same family. It's, it's a horrific case. And previous to that, children would run around all over Australia that, you know, it was very typical for children to leave the house in the morning and not come back until dinner time. So, you know, and so from, from that point upwards, there was a lot more protection of children and, and, focus on children not being safe. That's still supposedly an unsolved uh, case, which is ridiculous because my father admitted that his dear friend, Anthony Munro, who's now a convicted pedophile, thrice convicted pedophile, brought the dead Beaumont children to our Edwardstown property in the boot of a car. He made that confession in 2015 and that aired after his death in 2017 on Channel 7 News Today Tonight. Now, that stunning new lead in the decades-old Beaumont case, as you would have seen in the news, a chilling video of a suspect has surfaced less than a week after his death. Now, members of Max McIntyre's own family are convinced their father was involved in Jane, Anna and Grant's disappearance and that they know where the children are buried. Here's Mark Mooney with the details. I know a lot about the Beaumont case. Put it to him directly, you know, were you involved, Max? He said, no, I wasn't, but I'll tell you who was. My father was involved in the abduction and murder of the Beaumont children. Could this man hold the key to Australia's greatest criminal mystery? So, you know, for, for him to make that confession, my, my brother is convinced, my brother Andrew McIntyre is convinced that they are in the sinkhole at Stansbury. There's multiple sinkholes on the property that my father used to own at Stansbury on the York Peninsula. South Australian police, federal police refused to go in there and excavate the spot uh, because there's a lot of other stuff in that spot as well. So it's not just this famous case could be solved through going in there. There's other things on that property that need to be looked at. Other bodies? Other bodies, yes. And Rachel, can you give us some background on, on your father? I understand because I've been following you for a while and I understand that he was part of a movement called the Rosicrucian movement. He was part of a few movements. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that and the history behind those movements? There's also the Golden Dawn, yeah. Freemasonry. Absolutely, yeah. So we've got, so he was he was a Rosicrucian, also a Freemason, um, and a member of the Golden Dawn sect and, and a Satanist, basically. Um, when you look at the Freemasonry aspect, his great well, his grandfather, my great grandfather, Joseph Wright, W R I G H T, um, was the Grand President of the Grand Lodge. So he was a very high up, if not the highest ranking Freemason in his time in, in South Australia. Um, the name Wright actually means Mason. And McIntyre, my father's surname, my maiden name, means son of a Mason. So it's a, you know, from from um actually that was my yeah, that's yeah. Sorry, maternal. The, the name McIntyre. So it's, you mean son of a mason? Is it of Scottish origin? Scottish, yeah. yeah. And, and so apparently, so just... Rosicrucianism is a Scottish version of um, Freemasonry, I believe. Sure. So the, uh, my understanding, there is a set, for lack of a better term, within Freemasonry, a division or a sect called the Scottish Rite. Yes. And that is at the most elite uh, within. You, you hear that, you hear that. So, you know, um, apart from my childhood experiences, I really have avoided anything to do with that sort of thing because sure. I don't want to, I don't want to uh, cloud or confuse my own 
personal memories with with what I've not been educated by. But yeah, it's it's a. I mean, these are really powerful sex. They they have an oath to one another to the brotherhood, well and, and truly above any other oath that they might have of office or you know, in, in say, the police or whatever else, that their oath to one another is more powerful than that. And have they had a continuous history going back many centuries, if not thousands of years? I believe so, yes, yeah. I've heard, uh, I mean, rumours, I'm, I'm not very familiar with the occult and with cults, etc. Uh, I am a religious person and I, I'm a, a student of the Bible, so I'm curious because Nimrod was a biblical figure. Uh, he opposed Abraham. He was his adversary. Uh, the, is it true that these cults go all the way back to Nimrod? Good question. And again, you know, it, the, it's a big, a big subject and a big topic, and not something that I've, I know well enough to really talk on. Sure. Yeah. Fair enough. And um, can you? Tell us a little bit about, uh, and I'll, I'll be curious to know a little bit more about MK Ultra a little later. But just a little bit about your your childhood growing up. Um, would it be fair to say, on, on the surface, did, did your family seem like a regular, typical Aussie family? If someone was observing your family from the outside, I guess they might consider that. Except, well, well, it, it got weird pretty early on. So. My father had uh, three children to a woman previous to meeting my mother and he met my mother when my mother was very young and got her pregnant. She had a child before she even realised he was married and had three children. He owned the house that I grew up in at that point. That house has access to tunnels um, and I was trafficked through those tunnels during my childhood. But... Basically, because he could not lose that house when he was going to divorce his first wife so he could marry my mother, he had her murdered. Now, I can say that now because she died in very strange circumstances. There's never been an inquest into her death, my father's first wife. her three elder, My three older siblings always believed that something terrible had happened to her. She, she, she died in a, in, a, um, in a situation that she should never have died in. So there's no actual cause of death <laughs> so many strange things have happened there so um even to the point where you know there were items of her jewelry that were supposedly missing but then my father later had them so he'd made reports that those those two items were missing and that he had them so and she had them on her when she when she passed so you know he obviously had a hand in that in some way so that's that's obviously not a normal situation and when my father brought my mother into this the family home with these three poor distraught children who just lost their mother. He told the neighbours that my mother's first child, my my older brother, was his <laughs> eldest child's son, who was 13. So no, it didn't really look that normal <laughs> on the outside. Um, and and basically he also had a, another relationship with a woman just around the corner from where we grew up. In the 80s, when I was about 10, he had a had another child with her. So he had a lot of stuff going on in, you know, in that that really from from the outside looked very dodgy. But I suppose if you would look at, you know, um probably my, my school friends probably didn't realise what was going on, that I've contacted them or well, they've got in contact with me since I went public and they said, you know, we did wonder if there was something, you know, not quite right there. Um my father used to be a line tapper for telecom, for, for what is now Telstra. So he was actually an ASIO operative, and that's why he had impunity from prosecution. Quite a few of the times that I contacted police or um, police ministers or whatever, I would have back, and, and federal police, I would have back a response saying that it was an operational matter. And I've been it's been explained to me that that means that it's, I don't know, subject to some sort of protective security and it, it, can't, be, it can't be investigated. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so the fact that he was a line tapper, that was what he did for 40 years, that's buying on people's phone calls, that's wow. being blackmail material on people, and that was his, he, that's what he did for a living, and that's he was very out there about that. So I guess, you know, I, I wouldn't say it looked particularly normal, but um, maybe people didn't join the dots. No, I'm curious to know, what was your mother like growing up? She was a good mother. 
but she was extremely depressed and mind controlled. So he had, my father was a hypnotist as well. So he had the ability to rapidly, rapidly induce her, which required nothing more than a few words and he would click his fingers and she'd be in another place. And it wouldn't matter what happened to us in front of her. She was completely oblivious. And then he would bring her out of it and she'd be shocked at the state that we were in. So wow. I, I don't believe that she was complicit. Um, it, it took me a while to process, you know, what had happened and the things that she was witness to, but incapable of doing anything about. Now that I know more about MK Ultra and mind control, I, I feel very sorry for her and what she must have gone through. Because, again, she was very young when she met him. She married him at 21. And is she still around today? I believe so. We don't have contact anymore. Sure, um, sure. But yeah, but unfortunately, when you go through this sort of experience as a child, there are points in your healing where you've got to let certain people go because they they want you to stay in a certain state because they can't deal with their trauma. So, yeah, it, it would be best for her as well to, to you know, she's got to do her own healing without being around me. And, and you mentioned uh, that he was linked to the intelligence community. So how how far do you, uh, does this how far ingrained is this in both the intelligence community and in uh, government and in the police this uh, cult network? Well, I've I've described my father before as the um, Australia's Epstein. So you know he even he even was a Navy reservist, but I cannot even get his Navy Reserve ID number. So I can get some information on where he was deployed or not deployed, but as a reservist, he was he was traveling a lot. So, you know, I because he had impunity from prosecution and because he was using me as a honeypot in many um, different various ways and, and other children as well and using us in child pornography and things, it's, you know, he was he was certainly allowed to get away with it. One of his closer friends, who's also a convicted pedophile, was the chief inspector of police. Um, so, you know, he just basically had carte blanche. He could do whatever he wanted. He would he would often say to me, he's and and to my siblings, that he was a special friend to police, meaning that he could do whatever he wanted. Wow. And so you mentioned that there were tunnels uh, underneath your home and there was also uh, an account where he took you to to some caves to explore some caves yes. um do you mind telling our, our viewers uh, about that absolutely yeah sure so um i went public about the tunnels in 2018 and then i did about two years of research with some beautiful people who helped me all over the world literally all over the world i had people coming and and helping me um just contacting me out of the blue and saying you're going to go through this map system and you do this and you contact these people and i had so much help but it, that two years was exhausting so i've managed to prove the existence of those tunnels, which is extremely important because if you look at the Finders case and the McMartin preschool case, these are cases where children were being abused in tunnels beneath a preschool. Because there were no records of the tunnels, the children's testimonies were ignored and disqualified, discredited. So I knew when I gave the allegation that I had been used in those tunnels that I would then have to prove the existence of them. I've done that. Um, I put out videos um, on my BitChute and Rumble channels regarding that evidence and I published it everywhere else as well so there was a hidden cellar and uh, my father built the house that I grew up in he built that in the 50s I believe my, my brother was witness to the fact that he had a brick maker his own little brick maker so he made his own bricks um he made a fashioned a um a cellar built the house on top of that next to the cellar was an old brick kiln which was an old wonderlicks um, terracotta brick kiln um, for the Wonderlix terracotta tile factory and he actually told one of my siblings that it was a brick kiln um, that it, there was a brick kiln under the shed I've been in there many many times unfortunately I can still smell it um, that brick kiln happened to be at a lower level because when the area was called Vermont and just so people know there was a, a another place in Vermont that Wonderlix factory was also uh, exploiting in New South Wales also called Vermont another um, suburb it was all full of clay and as they dug the clay out they built the kilns at that lower level and then after all of the clay had been dug out they changed the name of the suburb to Hammersmith 
and they covered all of the all the kilns over with dirt, they became cold stores, or or a lot of people just used them as somewhere to throw their rubbish. And then when the 1938 mandate came in for tunnels, trenches and bunkers prior to the Second World War, because there was a fear of the Tokyo Rose being moored off the um, deep waters of Kangaroo Island, and they thought that they were going to fly their 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 um, aeroplanes up South Road, everybody in the area in Adelaide particularly was mandated to build or dig a tunnel, trench or bunker within 20 feet of their back door of every business, every meeting place and every home. So, you know, we just had tunnels built everywhere. And so because it was an industrial area in Edwardstown and because the brick kilns were already there, they were then exploited, tunnels were built so that they could be used for the workforce, uh, the large workforce in that industrial area. On top of those are all the telecommunications tunnels. They are under every main street, every main road in Australia. They are long, long tunnels to take the cables so that you can use your telephone. And there are pits, you know, people walk over these grates with, with a T sign on them, um, metal plates on the road, on the, on the footpath and on the road every day and don't even realize what's in there. So if you shine a torch in either of the, of the hole, there's usually two holes in each, in each of those plates, shine, shine a, a hole in one end, go for the ones that have like four plates or eight plates that they, they get quite large. The junction, junction boxes are really quite large and they're at least six feet deep and a meter or two or three meters across, depending on how many of those plates are, are covering it. And you've got this tunnel system all through Australia. So that's another tunnel system. Wow. Plus you've got the water tunnels. The whole of so, Australia. Every main road, every main street. Covering the entire continent. Yes. Wow. That's how we have telecommunications. Yeah. So telecommunications companies are extremely powerful the world over. So they've they had enough money to do that. Um, and they're they're very easy to use. Some of some of those um, junction boxes are closed off at either end, but many are not. And in the state, um sorry, the suburb that I grew up in, Edwardstown, it's very unusual that the the there's telecommunications tunnels. On Castle Street, which my my street, Macklin Street, ran from, um, and also down now Deera Avenue or Almond Grove, now Deera um, next to the Glendale Boys Home, they're in very unusual places. Those are not main streets. They're not main roads. So very unusual for them to be on side streets. So again, that was all part of the original tunnel system that was being exploited. Um, and when you talk about the Glendale Boys Home, 106 boys went missing from there. There was a tunnel system going straight from the boys home to my father's cellar. And there was um, wow. a property in between that I don't want to go into too much graphic detail, but there was a property in between where, the, where they were processed. So, you know, with regards to the cave that you mentioned, there was, so the Stansbury property that my father owned, my grandfather owned before him, there's a, a series of, there's a little gully that runs through in a series of sinkholes. So sinkholes are where you've got uh, limestone and water will drip through and or just hollow out a cave, basically, uh, over time. Uh, one in particular of these sinkholes, there was a small tunnel that led from the sinkhole where the water had been dripping down and creating a cave. And the, then the water had trickled down out to the ocean. My father knew a way of getting in through this very small tunnel that he had to shimmy through in a wetsuit for him to get through because it's very, very sharp. Um, I had to crawl in on my hands and knees when I was about five. And then he showed me in there, um, he had a wall of skulls. And I know this is very difficult for people to believe, but I'll talk about the numbers of children that went missing in this state soon so that people have a bit of an understanding of, of what we're looking at. That I couldn't count 250 at that time, but by, by judging by the, the number of skulls there in this wall, um, or this small fence, I suppose you would describe it as, that there would have been at least around 50, um, just just wow. from memory, trying to piece it together. They were all small skulls. They were children's skulls, I believe. So he was collecting. He, he was a collector. And just on that, the night that he died, my brother who owns that property, not the brother that has spoken out about against my father, but the other one, one of the other ones, burnt a lot of items that night that my father died. And the um, witnesses to the fire, including my brother, or the fires, multiple fires, said that it smelt like burning hair. So I believe my father had a whole heap of other treasures. And, and we're talking about a serial killer here, so this is really revolting stuff, but this is what people were smelling on the night that my father died. This is 1 o'clock in the morning that my brother had to do this burning. And he was even asked, um, that there's actually um, news footage of him being asked, what were you burning? 
Wow. Just said, just wood, you know, at one o'clock in the morning, as you do. You wake up at one o'clock in the morning and burn it. Burn wood. A series of little fires of wood. Yeah, not jazz. Only responsible for disposing of the bodies, his father and Munro must have known who was involved in the abduction and murder. Andrew's been concerned that since Max's death, his half brother Danny has unwittingly destroyed some of their father's belongings. We're just wondering why you're burning all your dad's stuff. No, no, it's just wood, but I'm not saying a word. Do you think Max had anything to do with the Beaumont? Absolutely not. Um, but, you know, looking at the numbers of children that went missing, there there was um, the stolen generation from the UK. 150,000 children were taken from the UK and shipped all over the world to... Orphans. Yes, yes, to um, South Africa and to Australia and other countries. Um, of the 4,000 that were sent to, I think, specifically South Australia, only 2,000 remain. So 2,000 went missing from that 4,000. Uh, 600 went missing from the um, Goodwood Orphanage and 106 went missing from the um, Glendale Boys Home, just very, very close to where I grew up. So that's thousands of children. Wow. You know, that went missing. Nobody knows where they are. And that's the ones that had some sort of documentation. Uh, I, I once had a, um, I had a, I had a few uh, major crime interviews over my allegations of what I saw my father do. And I was told by a major crime detective that every child in Australia receives a birth certificate. And it's one of the stupidest things that anybody's ever said to me. Um, and this man then convicted a, another man uh, for a crime that my father had committed in front of me that I was a witness to that I'd given many, many details that only a person who knew the situation could have could have told. They still went after a different guy, a patsy. So my father could be could be protected further. And it was just a, a, a mind boggling moment for something so stupid to be stated. Now, Rachel, are you comfortable elaborating on what that crime was? Yes. Um, so a lot of people would have heard of the missing case of Louise Bell. Um, her first real name was actually Tracy. Um, she went missing in 1983 in January. Richard Kelvin went missing six months later. Both children my father had an involvement with. He didn't kill Richard. I don't believe he killed him because I wasn't witness to that, so I can't say he did. But I certainly know that Richard was brought in to be filmed with myself and, and Louise Bell, and a Chief Inspector of Police was involved with that as well. For some strange reason, those two children's missing cases have never been joined together in the media. Um, I've published photographs linking my family to the Kelvin, fa Kelvin family, um, and I've, I've published a photograph as well that links my father to the Bell family. But still, um, nobody will investigate. I mentioned elaborated in a major crime interview that when Louise Bell went missing she looked a lot older and she had a different hairstyle to all the photographs that they were airing of her at the time that she went missing. I know a friend of hers who grew up with her who said that when she heard the news items and saw the photograph she didn't actually recognise her, her friend because she was so much younger and they weren't using her first name. Now when I told the major crime detectives that Within a very short space of time, I think it was about a week, I've, I've documented all of this. I document every single letter, every everything, every report number, everything that I've had. I've got a long list, running list of, of, of all of these details. So it's within about a week of me giving that very important information. They then aired, never before aired footage, which they'd been sitting on since she went missing. Of her in exactly the same hairstyle. I even said that her hair was sun bleached or, or had been badly bleached because it, it, it was obviously there's some, some sort of bleaching that occurred. And you can actually see it in the footage. Her hair was different. She looked a lot older. It was the hairstyle that I described, very, very different to the bobbed hair, haircut in the photos that, um, that are always aired of her. And I believe that that was actually released to try and discredit me because I'd proven something very, very important and they wanted to discredit what I'd said again to protect my father. Were these children orphans, these two kids that went missing? No, no, they had families. No, and Richard Kelvin's father was in the media. Um, Rob Kelvin is the Channel 9 news present presenter, and he worked with my cousin. Richard was working for my paternal aunt shortly before he went missing. 
uh, we had barbecues with the Kelvins. My sister, who's now deceased in very dodgy circumstances, she had a house with Richard Kelvin's auntie and she also ran a business with Richard Kelvin's auntie. So we were very, very close with the Kelvins. That, because that's unusual because uh, by the sounds of it, it seems that a lot of the victims were orphans. So the meaning, so essentially if they were to go missing, no one would miss them, no one would look for them, no one would search for them. Why do you think these kids were different? Why were they targeted? I don't think I should go into that, Leon. Sure, no, that's okay. That's all right. Um, so, uh, in well, can you tell us a little bit about um, in, in, there's MK Ultra, uh, and uh, you spoke about different experiments. Are you comfortable discussing that? Yeah. So, um, for people who are not aware. The MK Ultra program is just an adjunct to what was happening in the Second World War with the Nazis. So at the end of the Second World War, the Nazis were then um, shipped off to America and Australia under Operation Paperclip and Operation Matchbox. So um, Mengele actually made it to Australia. He was actually operating in several countries after the Second World War. And I know multiple um, uh, victims of his. Um, I was used in the psychic theta programming under MK Ultra, my father handed me over for that for that testing and experimentation, and I was also used in medical experimentation. Um, so the mind control programming they do this to children to see what human beings can can do, what we're capable of. Um, a lot of it involves torture. It involves. Um, Psychic driving, I think is what they call it, where they'll just play the same refrain of music over and over and over and over and over again to see if they can get the person to dissociate that way or they'll torture the child to make them dissociate or they'll sexually abuse the child to make them dissociate and then they can actually split off alter, alter personalities. That um, And if you're under the Super Soldier program, they will be splitting off alter personalities that they can then program and then under a, a certain phrase or a certain sound that might be played to the individual that might activate the super soldier then to go and do whatever they've been programmed to do. So this is, you know, these are assassin programs so they can get people to go out and murder people. We hear a lot about false flags and a lot of people, you know, who there's a lot of famous murders that, you know, it's believed that the people who took them out were under the MK Ultra program and had been through the super soldier programming and had been activated to go and take out these people. So it's it's what, if you look at the psychopaths around the world, they really want a whole bunch of slaves. And a lot of us, you know, in, in many various ways, we work for the man to make them money and we get a little tiny piece of that after we've paid our taxes. Mm -hmm. So they what they really want is a bunch of robots running around doing what they want them to do. And so that's what the mind control programs are about. And you get this en masse in larger sort of widespread programs through programming on television where they're telling you what to think in the programs um, and they um, they use oh gosh predictive programming in Hollywood movies it's it's a, a lot of what you see it's interesting watching all of these alternative things like what you're doing and and what I've been doing and so many of the other people that I've been working with we're producing content that is not programming <laughs> it's the absolute opposite we're waking people up um, I did an interview with a gentleman the other day whose his program is called The Wake Up. So, you know, if we're working, I think people have to have a lot of hope because we're actually, we're all working together. All the, all the altruistic, like-minded, kind-hearted people are working together to try and undo that programming right now. And it, it is working. It is working. Last four years have absolutely gone against, I think, what the program was supposed to be. So that, and that word programming for television, for example, so that's a very deliberate choice of words. It's not exactly. a coincidence, not an accident by design. No, 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 no accidents. Now, I'm going to get a little bit tongue-tied trying to pronounce this uh, word. Uh, I'll try to write it down. You, you also spoke about, or you've recently been speaking about a concept called, it's related to the eye, central heterochromia. Sorry, I'm getting oh, tongue-tied. Yeah, <laughs> What does that mean? Okay. So, again, under the um, the Nazis under the, in the Second World War were experimenting on gypsies that had a, a particular iris colour called central heterochromia. 
So central heterochromia can often be misdiagnosed as hazel colored eyes. Basically, it's a ring of color around the pupil that is different to the rest of the iris. Now, apparently in some circumstances that can be caused by, I'm not a neurodologist, but that can be caused by, um, I don't know, um, liver toxins or something like that. So, but if it's a genetic trait, it'll be in multiple family members and that will be identical amongst those family members as, as is the case in my family. So I have it. Um, the Nazis are experimenting on um, gypsies with this eye colour in, in the Second World War because they wanted to, they, they had a fascination with the occult. If people aren't aware of that, the, the Nazis were absolutely obsessed with the occult and they wanted to experiment on these people because they had psychic ability. So it, it's it's part of that process. It's also interesting to look into the particular bloodline families that have this trait. So my, my family is a bloodline family that has this trait. It, it's related to RH negative bloodlines as well, which is another one of the, the, the many different kinds of, you know, these elite families often are RH negative bloodline families and they have this condition. Yeah, so um, I, I believe, and although I can't prove it, um, Yes, but I believe that there may be aspects of the electromagnetic spectrum that people with central heterochromia have can actually perceive differently. That's something that I'm working on at the moment. But um, the Hindus definitely believe that people with this eye, co eye colour could see into the future or help commune with God or could promote wow. those sorts of things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because uh, uh, and the symbol, the, this one-eyed symbol that people commonly talk about, that's linked to the Illuminati, for example. Is that is there any connection to that? Well, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I have been mm. wondering about that most certainly. Um, it seems to be. This is the thing: if you didn't know that this was the case and that this was something they were fascinated with, you wouldn't know that your eyes are unusual and that is as plain as your eyes on your face. They can look at you and they can see it, and then they can think, "Well, that's that's a that's a perfect subject." So I think you know people who have children with this eye variation maybe shouldn't be plastering their pictures all over the internet. <laughs> that's mm. something that's a concern to me. You know, when I when I came out with this information, this is actually not my research. This was. Um, my cousin Doug McIntyre's research, and he's done a brilliant job. And I've just been sharing it because I I, I talk on on interviews a little bit more frequently than he does. Um, people have been sharing, you know, their photographs of their own iris in in Telegram groups and things. And I've been, I've been saying, don't do that, don't do that, because that can be that can be a, a marker or an identifier. And you know, God for God's sake, don't put your children's eye photos, you know up on the internet because again you know if you've seen the minority report good old uh, predictive programming they they do want to use the iris as a as a um, an identifier as, mm. as a digital identification or form biometric facial biometric sorry yeah biometric along with your fingerprints so it's kind of like a fingerprint where it's probably it goes even deeper than that more so yeah, yeah. your fingerprint's not going to tell if you're going to be psychic you, you mentioned something interesting. You mentioned uh, Mengele, a very notorious uh, character, and you mentioned that he was in Australia because the official story was he uh, died in uh, while swimming in a in a river in Brazil. Uh, is the official story accurate? Do you think? I would say not. I would say not because I know multiple victims of his. I, I don't remember him myself, but I at least four. I'll probably have to go through with the ones that have spoken to me, but there's at least four that I know of that are high profile who've told me that they had interactions with him on different continents. Because, mm. yeah, not, not a lot was known about what he was up to after the war. People, I mean, there's just bits and pieces of information of him being in South America, but not a lot of detail. So I think that's really interesting. I mean, granted, you haven't had any contact with him, thank God, any direct contact. Do you know how long he was in Australia for? No, I'd have to go over what what my that those people had told me. So yeah, I'd, I'd have to go over it. But no, I'm not. I'm not sure. Sure, sure. Well, that's fair enough. And there's just so, so much I want to cover off. But there's in terms of you mentioned. So there's a Channel Nine studio in Adelaide. Um, can you talk to us uh, about that? Give us a little bit of insight into that. 
so again, my father had connections to Channel 9 Studios and my cousin was a producer, um, particularly of the Humphrey Bear, Be Bear Show and Channel Niners. And and obviously, you know, worked with Rob Kelvin and Richard went missing and, and was brought to our house to be abused. Um, I was taken there as a very small child. I reckon I was about, I reckon I was about three. Um, and there was an, a radio jock there that has since died. Um, and I was taken into a radio booth. I was brought there by both my parents. Whilst my mother was distracted, the radio jock raped me. Um, and then after that, I was taken into a different radio booth. And then I was sexually abused by somebody wearing um, the top half of a Humphrey B. Bear suit. Now, I had always really loved Humphrey B. Bear up until that point. Um, that was filmed. Later on, I met somebody who told me he had seen this footage after it's after I'd shared some some um, photographs of me as a child. He freaked out and he said he'd seen this horrible footage. It took him a while to actually admit to it. It wasn't something that he wanted to watch. It was just shown to him by some people. He said, oh, "I found this really creepy thing. Look at this." Because um, as you can imagine, with Humphrey, be bears, you know, upper torso being used, you know, would have would have seemed pretty freaky, and he he had recognised me. So I've not seen that, but I know that that happened. And then shortly after that, this is what they do. They This is part of the mind control programming. They'll often use puppets as well. Um, I'm not the only person who's been used in that way. So um, whether it's a full body suit or, or a hand puppet, they they like to use them in the, in the programming. Um, after that, it was organised because, again, my, my cousin was the producer for Humphrey, the Humphrey Bear show. He was... Someone in the suit was brought out to my family home and I was forced to be filmed in the backyard with him. I was absolutely terrified. Um, so they'll do that as a follow-up when they do something abusive like that to, to reinforce the trauma, especially when you're around family members who should be protective, who are all saying, you know, because the pressure is that there's going to be filming, there's going to be some sort of footage, there's, there's some sort of accolade for the parent in in allowing this to occur because you know their child might be on the television or whatever the child is utterly traumatized I was so traumatized by that whole experience I did not want to go anywhere near this this person in this suit um that's so that the child will feel that you know they have no protection no one's going to listen to them so even if I had had the ability at that point to say hey there's something horrible horrible happened to me it, it would have been ignored but I was still very young and you also sp speak about uh, experiments on the population of Adelaide. And there was a reference to, uh, again, I might get a big tongue tied here, Kuru prions. Yes. Yeah. Can so you, um, give us some insights. Well, just to, to, to precursor that with um, some information about the Maralinga experiment. Um, so a gentleman called Frank Walker wrote a book about this. So they did um, some um, nuclear experiments in Maralinga. They did it purposefully on a particular day where the wind would carry the fallout over pasture lands. They pastured cows on the grass because it's well known that, stront that strontium-90 is kept picked up very well by grass. The cows then concentrated into the milk and then the milk was given for free to children in, in the um, uh, public schools. So that's that's a that's an Adelaide wide, wide experiment, very well organized. They knew exactly what they were doing in getting the milk. And of course the children at that time, milk wasn't something that, you know, just grew on trees, you know, it was, you know, a lot of poverty at that time. Everybody thought that they were getting a little bit of help. And if you look at the cancer rates um, in, in the populace of Adelaide, it's quite high. Similarly, the the rates for things like Lewy body dementia, which is a prion disorder in Adelaide, are far, far outside the norms of, say, the worldwide population. Very unusual, very high levels. So in the, um, I believe it's the 1950s, 1960s, um, and particularly 1960s, there was supposedly a, a, in Papua New Guinea, there was this uh, 
they called it the laughing sickness, I think they said, um, and it was a, a prion disorder. Now, they said that it was a through funerary cannibalisms, cannibalism, so I'm getting tongue-tied now. Um, so the Papua New Guinean tribal people supposedly would eat the bodies, the brains, organs and things of um, their, their deceased. Now, whether or not that was, you know, you certainly see these documentaries but you just never know what they're actually saying I can't speak their language I don't know if they're actually saying those things that's how it's been interpreted I certainly wouldn't trust Michael Alpers and, and what he was doing um, but basically 75 cadavers were brought Kuru infected cadavers were brought over from Papua New Guinea to the Adelaide Medical Centre and experiments were um, took place so that that's fact that's scientific fact they were brought over uh, my father was involved with the Adelaide Medical Fraternity and he gave over his children for experimentation. So I'm not the only one who got experimented on. In, there were three attempts to uh, infect me with the Kuru prions. Thank God it didn't work. So I've since discovered, I can't remember the gentleman's name, but there's a, a doctor who's talked extensively about how children have an ability to avoid infection from prions, whereas adults do not. I believe all of that, and I've, I've published, um, and it went viral actually, um, documentation that my dear friend and researcher Julianne provided to me, where uh, epidemiologist and a very, very, I think he got, he, he got knighted or, or got a title for this, Order of Australia Medal, um, for his work on Kuru. His name was Roy Scragg. He worked in Adelaide, um, and he was working with the World Health Organisation on Kuru for the purposes of depopulation. And I have put those documents up on my Telegram channel and they went viral. So I've had over 260,000 views on one post where I shared that. Wow. Yeah. So um, that that links back to everything that I've been talking about because I, I went out of, and started speaking about the Kuru prion experimentations back in 2018 before anybody else was talking about it, before anybody else really sort of knew what it was about. Um, I got absolutely hammered, hammered for speaking about it. And it's interesting, one of my my trolls who's actually paid to to harass me came in and used a, a pseudonym as fact checker. Now, back in 2018, <laughs> fact checkers, they were, you know, it wasn't something you really heard much about. Now you can't get away from them. But, yes, I could tell by her fury, uh, and she's also a mind control slave, so, you know, I, part of me feels sorry for her as much as she's an irritation. Um it, it was it was telling. It was very telling. And now what we have now is these things that I probably can't mention. I'll I'll do a gesture to the arm mm. that are causing an enormous number of prion disorders. However, something very very positive came up, and it's obviously very very close to my heart because I still have the concern that this might be something that that causes me grief at some later stage. So prion disorders called cause dementia, Alzheimer's, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, otherwise known as uh, mad cow's disease, Lewy body dementia. There's a whole series of problems that they cause. They cause a spongiform encephalopathy of the brain. So you get like Swiss cheese. The brain just starts to fall apart. The prions are a misfolded protein and they convince other proteins to misfold. So it's a knock-on effect. And the more of these that you have in your body, the worse it gets. But Anna Maria... Milhaker, I think her name is, or Mahalsia, who's a um, PhD MD. Um, she's just recently brought out a Substack article where methylene blue actually kills prions, and it's something that you can take, and it's basically a cure. And it's very mm -hmm. interesting what she was describing in that article. She's obviously a highly intelligent individual. It also can take out the nanotechnology, so we have a cure. So I could keep talking about, you know, I kept believing obviously biased desperately you know biased in in the desire for there to be a cure that appears to be what that is that only came out last week i was only aware of it oh, i think it was this week I, I only posted about it a few days ago massive 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 moment for me and for many many other people so we <clears throat> we do not have this huge horrifying thing hanging over our heads anymore whether or not now that'll end up being the new ivermectin and uh, be banned everywhere, I don't know. I certainly hope not. But it's a lot of hope. It's a lot of hope. Absolutely. And so the overall objective 
one is obviously one motive would be depopulation, uh, getting people sick and I guess not getting getting them to die straight away, maybe over time with cancers and things. Is it also to enslave people, get make them more docile? Is that the purpose of infecting them with these prions? Well, this is the interesting thing. So when I when I first spoke about this in 2018, it was published um, under uh, the zombie zombie apocalypse um, article. And my father told me when he first told me that I'd been infected. I just had the horrible experience of seeing Louise Bell murdered in front of me. I had escaped the cellar to get away from what he had just done. Then he came out to reinforce the horror, to tell me that I'd been infected by these prions and that it would, I, I would, I would die a very slow, horrible death, <laughs> basically. Um, at the time, he called it scrapey. At a at a later date, um, a few years later, he told me it was actually Kuru. And he had been experimenting on that, on the uh, neighbourhood children um, with, with scrapey. Somehow, scrapey is a prion disorder of sheep. He'd somehow got access to a powder of this particular kind of prion and had been putting into little wounds on the back of the hands of the children in the neighbourhood and, and siblings, my siblings. Um, I think what they were trying to do, so, so Satanists, psychopaths, don't have any spark. They don't have a, the ability to create. And so what they do is they go by the old playbooks. And I think they were trying to go by the biblical playbook of bringing about a zombie apocalypse. The problems with prions is they cause people to act out and behave in a... So if you look at Louis body dementia, um, the symptoms are a very um, kind of... A, a, it's almost like that the feet slide along it, it, as the condition gets worse, it's a very rapid uh, onset condition. You can die within a year of, of it, symptoms coming on. So the gait is very sort of uh, like a zombie. Um, they're very aggressive, very aggressive. So you get aggressive behaviour, weird physical movement. Um, I think that's what they were trying to do. It, it's just so completely insane and sick. But when you look at the CDC, they have their uh, zombie apocalypse, you know, preparedness plan. <laughs> Mind-blowing. Yeah. It is. It really is. So sounds crazy, but there's just so much evidence that's pointing to it. And I, I want to move on to the Beaumont children. So this is a case that has perplexed and troubled Australia. It's, I guess it's the case that took away Australia's innocence. Um, can you... Give us some insight. You did also mention, this is interesting as well, because a lot of normies would be watching this and think the average normie, oh, this is crazy. This is, uh, you can't believe this. You know, it's made up stuff. But the most interesting aspect of this, of your father being connected to it, to this, is that the mainstream media actually reported on it, Channel 9 News, not long before he passed away. Yeah, so... So the night my father died, again, those 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 fires were burning and that, that got in the news. Um, he had already admitted that Anthony Munro had brought the children, the three Beaumont children, to our Edwardstown property on the day they went missing and they were deceased in the boot of a car. Now, my father made my two sisters look at the children in the boot of the car. My brother was there that day, Andrew McIntyre, who's also spoke out to the ITNJ and he's given multiple... Um, interviews since and and put up his own stuff on his Facebook page as well. Um, my father's admission, it, it went into an article, but it was actually aired, um, the video of it, shortly after his death, like within a week or a few days of his death. So they were just sitting on it, waiting and waiting and waiting until he died, and then they released it. For that to have come out and then there's still no dig at the Stansbury property is just insane. So my brother has very good reason to believe that the children are there because of Anthony Munro's behaviour in the weeks after her, their death. Um, it would take nothing more than I'd say about forty thousand dollars to exhume that sinkhole. That's that's what we've for a forensic proper forensic dig. That's all it would cost. They dug up the um, Castelloy factory grounds, going after this Harry Phipps guy who looked nothing like the identical photo. Um, my father looks a lot like the identical photo of the guy that was on the beach with the children. Um, basically, 
basically because because Harry Phipps' son said that he thought he saw the children there. Well, they dug up the Castellui factory um, site, didn't even wear the proper forensic suits when they did the dig either. That cost $250,000. We're talking at a fraction of that amount for the Stansbury dig. There's 35,700 signatures on a petition to dig at the Stansbury property. You can't even look that up. You have to get the specific link, which is on my YouTube channel, if anybody wants to go and have a look under my name, um, and please sign it. Um, so change is sort of kind of hidden it, but you can still, it's still there. So over 35,000 signatures, is a, that's a pretty profound number. They managed to get the Castello dig on Harry Phipps' son's say and about 1,500 signatures on a petition. And they said that they had to do it because of the community pressure for 1,500 people. <laughs> I mean, far out. Um, there's so much evidence. My father worked at Glenelg Beach at the telecom um, exchange there. He There was a diary placing him and several other, other people of interest. One of the people named in the diary sexually abused me as a child. I saw him involved with the murder with my father of, of another child. He needs to be investigated. Um, there were several other people of interest that were on the beach, according to this diary, in the weeks and days prior to the Beaumont children abduction. So there's reams of evidence yet again, including my father's confession about the children being brought to his house, and yet still no action. So one really interesting factor that um, needs to be taken into consideration is, is that my my brother Andrew McIntyre had Anthony Munro put away for the abuses that An Munro perpetrated against Andrew during the same time that the children, the Beaumont children, went missing. There was a photograph of a man on the beach watching a search for the Beaumont children who the media desperately tried to connect to Bevan Spencer von Einem. Andrew has produced a photograph of that young man and it wasn't Bevan Spencer von Einem. It's a guy called Brian Medlin. That still hasn't been followed up. Um, that photograph was taken by Anthony Munro's camera. And um, uh, John Pike is in the photograph. John Pike is another of my father's friends who's a convicted pedophilist. He's doing 18 years for, for pedophilia, which in this country is very, very, very unusual. He definitely deserved to go to jail. But part of the reason why he got 18 years and not just one year, like most pedophiles would do for, you know, you can get, you can have multiple, multiple, multiple people making allegations against you and only get a year. He got 18 because he was actually clandestinely uh, recording conversations with my father before my father died. So he, he wasn't, he wasn't liked for daring to do that. Um oh, Where was I going with that? Oh, so, so yeah. So, so Brian Medlin. So, you know, again, there's this, it's, it's so bizarre. The family murders, there were multiple murders. They've only ever put one guy away for it, and that's Bevan Spencer von Einem. And they're also trying to shove the, the, the Beaumont case onto him because there was someone on the beach that supposedly looked like him, which he, this guy doesn't look much like him at all. Uh, and if you look at photos of, of von Einem at the time that that photograph was taken of the man on the beach, they don't even look alike. See, it was, so was he just a patsy? I believe so, yeah. I, I think he was pedophile. I think he was mm. having a relationship with Richard, which he shouldn't have been doing because Richard was only 14. Definitely wrong. That's disgusting. Mm. But I don't think he killed him. And the official uh, narrative of Beaumont, you want to suppose, the viewers, I don't know, I mean, everyone in Australia knows. There might be some people from overseas that might be watching that might not know. So they're three children, all siblings from the same family. I believe no, uh, one was 11, 9, and four. Four, uh, Nine, seven, and four. Two girls and a boy. And they disappeared in broad daylight. They had two loving parents. And we're meant to believe that these three children disappeared on a crowded beach and in broad daylight in Australia, in Adelaide, and uh, off the face of the earth, and no one knows what happened to them. So that's the official narrative. But uh, you believe, and it makes sense when you think about it, that there's obviously a high level cover-up involving the police and the, go the government. And for those people who find that difficult to believe, that, that you know, that maybe they just went off and had a life somewhere, we had a Prime Minister who disappeared from a beach. That's also true. 
Harold Holt. So this is the sort of place that Adelaide is. Um, you know, you've Australia's a very, very there's a reason why they keep the population so low. You know, if, if you were from a different country and you wanted to come into Australia, the 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 rigmarole that people have to go through just to get here is just a, well, it used to be that case. I don't know if it's the same now, but it's because they wanted to keep the population down, because they wanted to have total control. So this is like a test, a test case, a test area for this new world order that they were trying to bring in. So, you know, you, you can't have three children just disappear like that. It's not possible. We've got plenty of evidence to prove that it was my father that was involved with it. Anthony Munro was involved with it. Um, this, this group that my father was involved with that were named in this salvage and expedition diary, we put them on the beach before the children went missing. They were involved. So it still hasn't been properly investigated. And I, I think part of it is that the media makes so much money from those children. Um, the, there's so many books that come out that people make money out of those children. It's a money spinner. I think that's part of the reason why they don't want to solve it. And I heard your uh, your brother's testimony about what actually happened to the Beaumont children. It may have been an accidental death. Is that um, do you mind elaborating on that, or is that something you are comfortable? I, I don't believe it's accidental. I don't believe it was accidental. There, there was, my father told stories about what had happened and one of them was that someone had run them over or something along those lines and that was absolutely rubbish. Yeah. You know, I, I'm also just curious to uh, touch on uh some events that have happened overseas that would be linked, perhaps linked to Australia, high profile events. One involving Jimmy Savile. Uh, there was also an orphanage in, uh, I believe it was in uh, the, the Channel I Islands where they discovered bodies and Jimmy Savile was apparently linked to that. Uh, but he, he was officially accused of pedophilia, but that was apparently, that's just the tip of the iceberg. It goes deeper than that. But th does Australia have its own version of Jimmy Savile? Well, yes, because the media is um, the media is really dodgy in Australia. So um, he he was working with the BBC quite a bit, wasn't he, Savile? That's so, right. Yeah. So where you've got people with film equipment and studios and all of you know. A lot of them do produce, I believe, um, child rape material. My father was producing child rape material in the underground cellar. And, and obviously, you know, what happened to me at General Arm was pretty horrific and obviously, you know, involved that. So I don't want to name names, but there's certainly been, you know, a lot of uh, stuff published and allegations made about very high up media personalities in this country. Some recent allegations being made uh, against Alan Alan Jones, broadcaster. Yeah. And rumours going around about others. But this, I mean, that pedophilia would be just scratching the surface. There's something more sinister go yeah. going on that's linked to these high-profile celebrities that we all know that are household names. Yeah. But again, you've got to be careful what you say. Allegedly. <laughs> and there's there's one character that I just want to touch on. Uh, Al Alfred Kinsey yeah. lived in the uh, well. He he did research in the 40s and 50s. I think that was at the prime of his career that that decade, the 40s and the 50s. Uh, was he was he a very big influence? I mean, he was linked to. Um, you know, the, 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 the 60s revolution. Uh, he passed away before that in the 50s. But uh, has his, do you think his research, um, his work has impact, like what, what sort of influence has he had over, um, you know, with everything that we're seeing today, ma manifestation of sexual education uh, with children, et cetera? Oh, it's, it's very horrific. If you look into what Kinsey was doing, it's absolutely horrific. So 
oh gosh um you know this is someone who was clearly a pedophile there's absolutely no way you could see it from any other point of view i mean what purpose could there possibly be to learning whether or not a child can have an orgasm and that's what his whole purpose was to prove it and this was obviously funded by a whole series of pedophiles who wanted to try and make it sound like children wanted to have some sort of sexual interaction with with adults and i can prove categorically that that is not the case no child wants to have a sexual interaction with an adult ever so um so the experiments that they they were doing were basically purely pedophilia but they were doing it under the guise of psychiatry and learning about the human body and they felt that they had the right to do it and they were obviously given carte blanche ability to do it so i think it does have enormous influence unfortunately um he does get referenced and you know these are the sorts of things this is you know all those children who suffered in that way should not it should not have been in vain because i'm i'm hoping that we're coming into a time where those sorts of things sorts of things will never ever happen again so obviously when you when you have a population or people in the media or whoever who focus on sex they focus on the physical they focus on all these things that are really fleeting and unimportant i believe we're here to have some sort of uh fundamental spiritual experience where, where i believe we're a soul having a human experience in this lifetime and that is what's that's what is important and what is really important is making choices about whether or not you're a selfish person or a selfish soul or an altruistic one when you get the media all these influences, all these people that are obsessing about the physical outer appearance, this 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 shell that we have while we're having this human experience that's fleeting and you know it's mortal, you're completely going away from what the purpose of life is. And I think that's by design. They don't want us to deepen our abilities. They want to experiment on the people who have psychic abilities and have, you know, can commune with, with otherworldly entities and those sorts of things behind closed doors because they're interested in that sort of thing for their own abilities, for, the, for their own power, whatever they want to achieve out of it. But the rest of us are supposed to be focused on, you know, the prettiest car, the prettiest face, the nicest hair, all these stupid things that really mean nothing. So the Kinsey experiment was a part of that in that, you know, focus on what feels nice what your physical mm. body does, you know, don't focus on whether or not that's morally corrupt and disgusting and what you're doing to those poor children. Focus on pleasure and outward things. So it's quite horrific when you think about, um, you know, these safe schools programs and these programs that they bring into the schools where they're trying to supposedly protect children from being exploited. But in actual fact, the entire program is about exploiting children. It's really disturbing. There are certain things that children just shouldn't know. They don't need to be exposed to those things until perhaps they reach puberty and they're curious. It's really unnecessary. Pushing this gender fluidity stuff and you know saying that you can change your gender and if you express any opposition to that, you all of a sudden branded a transphobe or a bully. Yeah, it's very insidious. And, 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 you know, I know trans people, they're beautiful people, mm. love them dearly. But you can do that as an adult. Don't do not do it to a child. I mean, I saw something about some four-year-old being transitioned before they go to kindy. Uh, that was in wow. the Adelaide, or sorry, the local news or, or um, Australian news. That is child abuse. You know, when you have state-sanctioned kidnapping where the Department of Child Protection, police, the family courts, steal children from families because of supposed psychological abuse. 60% of children that are taken in Australia are taken because of psychological abuse or what the government deems is psychological abuse. And yet you have all of these protections for all these doctors that want to do these experiments on children to transition them. This is how skewed our world is. It's very, very disturbing. So I think children should be left alone. And Rachel, there's uh, inevitably going to be people amongst our viewers who have experienced or been traumatised uh, growing up with horrific child abuse, sexual abuse, uh, physical abuse. What words of wisdom do you have for them or an advice to encourage them? Well, listen to your body 
first up, um, a lot of um, somatic memory is involved with physical abuse. So the body remembers often before the mind can even cope with the memory. So if your body is doing things and you can't get well for certain reasons and you just don't know what's going on, it might be a good idea to sort of, um, if there are things that you know happened but you just won't look at them because you're too scared to get a pen and paper and start writing it down. Kathy O'Brien, who's a survivor of horrific abuse, um, basically has stated that when you when you write things down, you take things, there's compartments in the brain. And when you take a memory from one place and you write it down, you're actually putting it into a different part of the brain. It releases it. And so the trauma can then be released and then the body and the, and the soul and, and the mind can heal from it. Um, and with the somatic aspect, a lot of the time you can get relief from doing physical activities that use both sides of the body, like swimming and those sorts of things, to get rid of the stress and the angst and the anxiety and the, and, and the stress. Um, there is obviously therapy that you can have. Um, I'm not a big advocate for therapy because I was abused by a therapist, but I know some really beautiful ones that can be really, really helpful. Reading books about other people's experiences can also help too because you don't feel so alone. And community, um, funny like-minded people who've gone through the same thing can be incredibly cathartic because it, it means that instead of being the crazy one, and often in these families, if you've been abused in your family and there's incestuous abuse, a lot of the family will just want it to disappear and cover it up and hide it. The shame is really intense. Um, so finding a community of people who've been through the same thing can release you from that shame. And most importantly, any abuse that happens to a child is not the child it's not for the child to hold any shame for because it's been done to the child. They don't have any reason to feel shameful about it. So um, trying to release that too is really, really important. Well, that's, those are the things that I would suggest. Try to avoid things like self-medicating, taking drugs, alcohol. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of people, if they've been sexually abused as children will be um, promiscuous. Um, these are all just acting out factors and it's really best to try and look at that and think why am I doing that you know um what what is that exhibiting try and change those behaviors and actually turn the healing inward yeah excellent and is there anything else that you'd like to share with our audience just um to thank them for listening because I know it's not it's, these are not easy subjects to to listen not to at all. just for having the courage to do that is amazing um, and I, I do believe that even though things might seem dark at, at times, and they have certainly seemed dark in the last four years, I really do believe we're coming into a time because so many people have woken up where we're going to have a different kind of world. And it's not the great reset that they're trying to create. It's something far, far different, far different. And I, I work a lot in the esoteric circles um, because I was opened up psychically as a child. Um, and there's so many different factors coming in at the moment that are pointing us towards a much brighter future than people realise. Mm. It's, it's the reason to have hope. I find it interesting that all the major religions, my religion obviously included, the Jewish religion, the Christian religion, Islam, they all believe in the redemption, which is the last and final stage, and there would be peace on earth. Uh, so I find that and in esoteric circles is also that belief is that correct it's correct yeah of, of a golden age and a time where there is peace and prosperity for all not just some and rachel how do people find you so um as my name is written here i'm on telegram bitshoot rumble i am on youtube but i always just push people over to bitshoot and rumble so um <laughs> a lot of censorship out there yeah yeah exactly um yeah they're the main places to find me and if you're not being censored, it means, well, if they are censoring you, it means that you're doing something right. <laughs> exactly. So you're on the right path. Yeah, that's right. Rachel, it was so lovely to, to have you here. Um, you're very brave, courageous and inspiring, and I'd really like to thank you for your time. Thanks, Leah.